Hello and welcome to today's episode of Relatable. How's everybody doing? I love this time of year. I love the fall. It's a good time for reflection and taking inventory and what matters as we approach the holiday season. If you're watching via Facebook Live, here's a question of the day for you. Do you favor change or things staying the same? For me, it's, com it's completely up to the circumstances of the situation. I believe that in order to experience the fullness of our humanity, growth is required. So I like change in that regards. We grow by ourselves, and of course we grow with each other. In business world, uh, the big words of change are disruption and innovation. If industries try to resist these changes, they're usually left behind as new technologies replace old ways of doing things. Disruption and innovation comes in all forms. Mark Zuckerberg's early model for Facebook was move fast and break things. <laughs> Considering how much they have actually broke, election tampering, influence hacking, uh, bullying, hate speech, spreading, you would hope they'd learn from those mistakes and slow down just a little bit. Come on, Facebook, slow down. Uh, this is pretty typical though in tech. Uh, new technologies are introduced without the consideration of the consequences. So I wonder, would bringing back an old idea be considered disruption? In the case of doctors making house calls, I kind of think so. Uh, and here's why. Our medical system is a nightmare. You know, earlier on this year, I was talking about the accident that I had and my experiences there. You know, we rush through diagnosis and we're prone to treating symptoms and not the cause. We overprescribe medications that lead to new problems, that lead to more chemical chemicals that are made in the lab being put into our bodies. Doctors who make house calls get to treat patients in their own environment, where the patient is more comfortable to share what's going on and their concerns. And the doctor is able to see what else might be contributing to the patient's health issues because they're in their actual physical environment. Uh, in a house call situation, the doctor is less likely to feel like they have to rush with the patient as there's no waiting room full of people that they need to attend to. Could doctors who make house calls be something we see in our future? Yeah, <laughs> and the future is already here. My guest today works for a company that, will, that offers doctor's house calls. Alex Bidner is a, is a physician's assistant and owner operator of the Los Angeles chapter of AMPM Doc, a 24 hour house call medical service. After practicing emergency medicine for almost three years, he realized the true art of medicine of medicine has been lost in the traditional environment. Being a house call provider with an emphasis on hospitality forms a deeper relationship, I'm speaking my words, with every patient and fosters a profoundly positive and healing environment. He believes meaningful conversation and physical presence are the most powerful method of healing and aims to use them along with his medical expertise to, posit positive, to positively impact each other. Love, love, love this. Hi, Alex. Thanks, thanks for being here Hi, today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'd like, you know, when I reached out to you, I was like, ah, I'm really excited about this for a lot of reasons. Like, mm -hmm. you're speaking all my language, meaningful conversation, slowing down. Um, I love it. So I'm happy that you're here. Um, I always ask the guest that sits in this chair before we dive into what we're going to talk about today. Is there anything that's kind of pulling your attention that you're just like, I want to put that out there before? we get into our conversation um i mean just going off of your intro change mm -hmm. is is hard for some people to deal with yeah just because it gets you out of your comfort zone but yeah. i think that change is is great and it brings about the best things yeah so. i mean change often is the thing that inspires us to look and take inventory mm -hmm. of what is working and not working so mm -hmm. you know that's how it led to me me doing this yeah so it's, it's good you know examining things even even just the process of like well let me start to see if change is required, even if you don't take that right. implementation step, there's value in that, right? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Well, so I love what you do. <laughs> I've already said that. Um, I wanna hear more about you and like you growing up and what were some of your early experiences um, with healthcare that sure. made you sort of take the path that you're on right now? Mm -hmm. So what I can remember as, as a young child, um, going to the pediatrician's office, I, I always loved it. I, don't, I didn't have a lot of sick visits. Mm -hmm. um, I just loved being at the pediatrician's office. I remember both of their names, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gooden and Dr. Cora. I, just, uh -huh. I loved being there. And then as a teenager, I, I had a lot of injuries. So yeah, just play sports. And, yeah. yeah, and you know, I was, I was kind of a, a rough kid. I was outside all the time. Yeah. Just 
had a lot of injuries and illnesses, so I was in the emergency room a lot, and I didn't necessarily like it, especially at the time, because I was not feeling well. Um, but I, I wasn't uncomfortable. Uh -huh. And then I started, you know, in my later teens, I started volunteering in a hospital, and I, I did it for a while, and I just really liked being in that environment, mm -hmm. and around medicine, around people, and people were trying to do good things. Yeah. And I just, I just really enjoyed it. Um, and that kind of confirmed that medicine was the direction I wanted to go. Did was anybody in your family in medicine um, so before? I had an aunt that mm -hmm. I wasn't super close with. Mm -hmm. She was a physician assistant, and she actually passed away really young, uh, which kind of brought it to my attention, and mm -hmm. I, I looked more into that. But sort of around the the same time, I and this is kind of a long story that I can't get too into. We but, have an hour. Uh, um, <laughs> No, I sort of, I, uh, I got a, a, you could call it a message per se from like God or the universe yeah. that medicine was meant for me. Yeah. And then that was, that was pretty early on. It was maybe, maybe 11 or 12. Like you had a dream or just yeah, some kind of. And, uh, it was an interaction with a person that was, uh, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, at the time I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't know what this means. And then as things started progressing and. Things were happening to me. I just I knew that uh, medicine was yeah. meant for me. I had a conversation last week with uh, a, a guest that we're going to have on in October, and I said the the term undeniably spiritual. I just it just came out, and I was talking about what I found was my calling, and it was like so. Sometimes I call it a God download, or and mm. it happens through it, you know interactions with people, mm. but it's just so undeniably spiritual. Like it just fills you. Yep. And you're like, oh yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be mm -hmm. doing. So I know, you know, these. I appreciate and know these moments mm -hmm. happen, and and um, it's great when you get it because it's you know life is kind of hard and confusing, and without yeah. that message, you're like, I don't mm -hmm. know what I'm gonna do. And, and I was not everybody has that, and I was very I was very blessed to receive that early in life. Mm -hmm. Like I I just knew when, I, you know, my my senior year of high school, I went to college, mm -hmm. I, which allowed me to graduate two months after I turned 21. And then I went straight into grad school and, and was practicing medicine at the age of 23. Wow. Um, tell me what a physician's assistant is. Because that might be a new term. Sure, for some yeah. People. So um, it, it's very similar to nurse practitioners, which is a more common field. Our education is a little bit different. Nurses mm -hmm. and nurse practitioners are nurses first and then go back to school and learn a little bit more advanced nursing and some medicine knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, physician assistant school is. is Depending on the school, about two and a half years, it's mm -hmm. a master's program, and you learn the same medicine that is in med school, it's mm -hmm. just more condensed. And you learn every aspect of medicine, just some of it's not as detailed as med school, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's very difficult. And um, by the time you're done with it, you're ready to practice medicine on your own. And so you can prescribe mm -hmm. medication, um, you're taught to uh, uh, inventory symptoms and things, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. uh, Patient, patient like bedside manner, these everything, these kinds of things. Yep. Uh, the study of anatomy, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the the medical training is is essentially the same as med school. Mm -hmm. it's just some aspects of some medical conditions, it's not super detailed. Um, but yeah, everything. I mean, there are, PAs can be in any field of medicine. You can do surgery. You can do um, family practice. Mm -hmm. You can do emergency medicine, like I did. Um, you can do you can do anything. And we do practice under a physician, so mm -hmm. we're not it's not we're not totally on our own. So you get to kind of have a mentor, you know, yeah. that you can talk to a, a mm -hmm. patient about and Yeah, so at my, at my job that I left in emergency medicine, it was, it was a fairly large group. I I worked under I wanna say fifteen to seventeen physicians mm -hmm. and there were um, I think twelve other PAs that we all worked together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean we it's a great environment, it's a great teaching environment. A lot of people say, at least in the medical community, mm -hmm. that when PAs get out of school, that first year is sort of like a residency in, in med school, how mm -hmm. you become a doctor and then you do residence. Um, but PAs, fully functioning PAs, I mean, essentially uh, can be as good as physicians. What, um, uh, what was working in the ER like? What did you do? What did yeah, you experience so, there? I was I was also very fortunate in the job that I had. Mm -hmm. I was um, 
I had the freedom to basically practice what we call the top of our license. So mm -hmm. I was, was able to do everything I was legally allowed to do and mm -hmm. what I was educated to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would see anywhere from 10 to 25 people in a day. Mm -hmm. um, it could be very basic stuff like in urgent care or mm -hmm. it could be very sick people who are on the brink of death. And mm -hmm. um, I from that field, you know, I'm, I have other certifications, you know, I'm certified in trauma life support and advanced cardiac life support, um, which it qualifies me further than what I need to do this. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen it done invasive procedures, um, save people who are essentially dying. Uh, is that something that's important to you to kind of keep going back and advancing your knowledge? Is it, is it a um, requirement? I mean, it, that's something that I've sort of pondered with, mm -hmm. um, but to do house calls, I don't necessarily need that mm -hmm. because the environment that I practice in is the medicine is easy. It's it's what we call it, an uncontrolled environment, mm -hmm. right? If something serious is going on, or if, if something goes wrong in someone's hotel room or in someone's living room, there's not really a lot of control we have. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of extra things we can do. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of a limited range of the problems that I can take care of. Mm -hmm. um, I'm qualified and educated to take care of pretty much anything. But uh, in but most cases, somebody that's calling a doctor in a house call situation, it's because uh, I feel sick. It's mm -hmm. not that they're in a, a life-threatening situation. Right. And, and I'm sure that's probably something that you... Like if they're calling you and that's and they're saying uh, this is life threatening or you know yeah. I'm, I'm, if I've been shot it's like you're not right. it's like exactly. you're gonna tell them mm -hmm. like yeah you need and to we call even have AMPM doc has a, a an 800 number at the call center and we mm -hmm. screen all the calls mm -hmm. if, if it sounds like somebody's very sick too, too much for us then we don't we don't take it. we, we refer send them to something to, else send, send them, them to the emergency room yeah. gotcha mm -hmm. okay so um, so you did you were in the emergency room and um, when did you start seeing like I kind of want to do something else with with my medical background. Or yeah, like. so I, I really love emergency medicine. I, mm -hmm. I love the the fast pace, and you never know what's going to come in, and you're you're always tested. Like, I mean, things would come up that you hadn't heard of for two years, and all of a sudden, like, you know what to do, and you do it. Um, I so, love I love that. So all of these shows like Grey's Anatomy, where they're like excited that there's some mystery disease. Like, do you guys get like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, there, like, there, oh, honestly, there, there are a lot of times where. You walk out of a room and, and you have sort of an idea, but you're not sure, and you go on the computer and read about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that, that does happen. Um, and there are some serious things and some not serious things. I, I truly did love that, but it wasn't always that. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of of my days, and it's not only the emergency room, it's, mm -hmm. it's all of medicine, was sitting in front of a computer, doing my documentation, or just waiting for tests to come back. And this and is the part you don't want. Yeah, to, because like you're not with the patient. You're actually exactly. doing mm -hmm. uh, health insurance forms or like a lot of. Yeah, just sitting in front of a computer waiting for tests to come back, or, or writing your notes on on your encounters that happen. Um, and to me, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but it's not. It's not really medicine. You know, mm -hmm. you're not doing anything constructive in those moments. I know it's the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I didn't necessarily want to leave emergency medicine. I just wanted something different, something that I was I felt like I was had more control over or something that I, I was really using my time to truly heal people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wasn't necessarily looking to do house calls. I'll be honest. I, I, I didn't just wake up one day and say, I want to do house calls. You didn't calls. get the God download no, on that. No, I knew I, <laughs> needed a, I knew I needed a change. And yeah. at, at this point in my life, I'm, I'm young. I don't have a lot of baggage. I can just pick up and leave and mm -hmm. take a risk. Um, and so I saw this opportunity, and I started thinking about it, like the idea of a house call. Like, wow, that's, that, that could really be something that that's what I'm needing. Like, mm -hmm. That's what I'm missing, like, the value of a house call where you're giving people their time back. Yeah. So tell me, um, you know, so as you started doing this, and what did you really see the opportunity was in terms of really helping somebody with health care? Like, you know, why, why do you think this situation, patient, um, uh, either seeing a patient while they're traveling, you mentioned earlier you see them in hotels or seeing them in their home environment, why is this um, better for the sake of the patient? To me, it's all about value. Um, when you 
you know, people are often see going to the doctor's office or going to the hospital or doing anything like that as an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Having to travel together, having to wait in the waiting room. Um, and then we're always rushed, right? If you're, mm -hmm. you've got other patients you're, yeah. you're taking care of or you just got a million things going on. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it shows, and it's, it's something you don't try and do. You try and be in every room and take the best care that you can, but it, it shows when you're working every day and you lose sleep or you have 20 other things you have to do. Doing house calls, um, I mean, it, it's very rare to have more than one at a time, but you, if somebody is, is in need, they wouldn't call you if they didn't need you, mm -hmm. and then you go to them, and they are more grateful and um, it leaves a bigger impact on because you're taking seems to them that you're taking time out of your day to go and see them. So you think there the so the value that you're talking about is the relational value. You think that like part of the path to the healing is them getting a confirmation mm -hmm. from somebody in the medical field that like hey you're okay or here's some here's some things that you can do mm -hmm. you know to to get you on the path of healing better. Um, but it's, it's this interaction. Yeah, and it sort of shifts their their perception of the visit mm -hmm. you know when, when they come into the office or to the emergency room it's taking it we're on their time mm -hmm. right when they're calling me to come to them it sort of shifted to my time so they value that more mm -hmm. and it just seems that there's there's less sort of the irritation uh, mood and it, it brings a better value to them it, so value but is it also kind of more of a mutual middle ground too because you're like, yes, they're recognizing that this person in the medical field came to them, but you're also now in their environment. It's a little yeah, bit Yeah, they're more easy. comfortable. Yeah, they're more mm -hmm. comfortable. I, I guess yeah, that. that's, when, that's when real things come out. Yeah, and um, I noticed that you wear black scrubs, and I mm -hmm. know that there's some statistic around um, people getting kind of nervous um, when they see somebody in a white coat or yeah, in the... Real thing. It's white a real thing, syndrome, right? Yeah. yeah, so... Um, did you choose to wear black because of so this that? This is like, AMPM Doc has always been black, black and gold. Yeah. It's um, sort of a the luxury, high class kind yeah. of professional look. Okay. And a lot, a lot of other house call companies or doctors, they look like a traditional doctor, you know, suit and tie with the mm -hmm. white coat. Mm -hmm. And we want to be different. Mm -hmm. so more, we, we bring a different package, so it's more yeah. of an aesthetic thing. But I, but you know, probably. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see, like, if it, you know how people feel if, like, you showed up in a white coat, mm -hmm. or this is like helps them share more. Just, or whatever. It, I think it's just a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how often, or how long do you stay on a house call? What is the typical length of a house call? It is usually about sixty minutes mm -hmm. from start to finish, and some of that time is paperwork. Some is kind of just talking about um, our treatment plan or what could be going on. Mm -hmm. But that that is one thing that also is. Is what I really like about this. Mm -hmm. Is that that I mean, you're in an office, and depending on the doctor and where you practice and yeah. the hospital system and all of that, um, the time in the room with the patient, trying to talk to them and get everything out, is five minutes, about, oftentimes less. Mm -hmm. And so I, I I really get to sit in the room with them and mm -hmm. get comfortable and allow them to get comfortable and just have. A normal conversation before we get into what's going on, mm -hmm. and that can really help people feel comfortable mm -hmm. to tell me what's going on. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that like that right there, an hour. Like I had it. We'll probably talk about this off camera, but I, I fell and hit my head and okay. my loft this year in April, and um, got to experience our medical system in a way that was not flattering and actually more traumatic than the accident yeah. itself. Um. And you know the idea of someone like sitting with you and you know for an hour like I just can't even imagine. Like, and it's not always that long. It it, it depends on what they want. You know, if they're in a rush and and they really just want something quick. I mean, I can cater to that. Yeah. If if they have time and and things seem to be going well, then th there's no time limit. How um what part of um just lifestyle uh, food um you know just making changes um, um, as you know, advising on some changes that they can make in their environment instead of just prescribing medication. Yeah, so How, what's the balance there? I, I am a very big believer in um, sort of changing your lifestyle before mm -hmm. pushing medicine. Mm -hmm. And because that's how you got there most times mm -hmm. is either what you've 
been eating or not been eating. Do you always ask that? What did, have, what, what's the last thing that you've ate? Um, it depends on the situation yeah. or what's going on. If, if it seems like it's a GI issue, then absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there, there's a, a lot of things that occur aren't by accident, mm -hmm. right? So if you're eating poorly for a long period of time, your health's going to deteriorate. Or if you're not as active as you should be, then your health's going to deteriorate. So changing those things first, it's how you got there. Mm -hmm. and there there's a, a good chance that that's going to correct the problem. If it doesn't, and it doesn't always, mm -hmm. then there are other options. And, I, and in some cases, I suspect you're seeing people while they're traveling. Um, you're seeing you know, um, people with very active, kind of on-the-go kind of lifestyles. Are they looking for that quick fix? It's like, yeah. I'm going to be in a meeting tomorrow. I'm on a movie set. Like They you know, are. Yeah. Um, and, th and that's... Um, it's sort of a tricky subject, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, a, it's a society now. We mm -hmm. want the quick fix. Nobody has patience. Um, and and so I have the conversation with everyone about about that and what, um, what probably is going on and what the treatment should be or what the best treatment has been shown in research mm -hmm. and what our options are. And sometimes if they're either not happy with that or are even willing to pay more money mm -hmm. for something that could possibly get them treated mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. um, so those are always conversations that we have when we weigh the, weigh the risks and the benefits and uh, what the best options Well, and that's probably the biggest part of the value equation here is like you do have more time to go through. Like there's no perfect answer to anything, right. especially in healthcare, right? So you get the chance to like weigh through different variables and then ultimately the patient decides, mm -hmm. for, you know with yeah. your input, but they ultimately will make a decision that mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to do right now. Yeah. Um, what, ha you know, is there, so seeing people in this environment and, um, you know, when they're kind of vulnerable because they're dealing with some, you know, something that mm -hmm. involves their health, um, are there interesting things that you've learned about people in general, um, about, um, you know how we're communicating, or you know, just the care, the kind of the level, the importance that we put on care or not put on care. Like, yeah. what what's been kind of eye opening for you? I would say that the first thing that comes to mind is, is probably the biggest deal is that so many things cause people anxiety, and they don't recognize it mm -hmm. as anxiety, and it makes them feel a certain way or make decisions they wouldn't mm -hmm. normally make, um, and oftentimes it leads to them calling me. Um, because say you're traveling from out of the country and you get sick and you don't want to ruin your vacation, you want to enjoy something, you don't want to waste the money you spent to come here. Um, and it, it causes a lot of anxiety. You're in an uncomfortable mm -hmm. environment that you don't know. You've never you've never been to the mm -hmm. city and you're, you need to go somewhere to get treatment or get looked at and, and you don't know. There's mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety around that. Um, and that's kind of what what I see as the biggest problem and what I aim to accomplish with my visit yeah. just through talking. I, um, I, I'm not surprised that's the thing that you see the most. My theory, part of my theory on why more people are experiencing anxiety is we live in a situation now where there's so much damn noise coming at us at all times. Um, and when I say noise, um, you know, media, uh, mm -hmm. content, you know, trends, uh, the, you know, all this stuff. And especially in the news system, there's a lot of trauma that happens in the news. And I don't know, and I'd be interested to hear you weigh in on this, is like, I don't know how, what this condition, the human condition, how we were made to deal with so much trauma at such a frequent way without having a way to process it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I say to people, um, Fan, you know, don't don't wake up in the morning and look at the news. It's never it's never going to work out really well for you, especially right now. Maybe have a time that you look at it, um, a certain time that you allocate that you look at it, and maybe work into your system a time where you can decompress with a friend or a loved mm -hmm. one to sort of release some of that. Because yeah. otherwise, we're just boom, 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 hearing mm -hmm. all these terrible things, and it's like, yeah, that's got to be affecting us. We don't have a way to release it. Yeah. So, you know, what are what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you have to find a way to deal with it. Everybody deals with it differently, whether it's exercising and getting your frustrations out or if it's talking to somebody, mm -hmm. a friend or a family member, or if it's going to a therapist mm -hmm. or um, sometimes it takes medication to, to help with that. But um, it, it's such a big issue. And at the root of it, you know, anxiety and depression go together mm -hmm. hand in hand. They're very complicated and, and there are a lot of details in it where it can come even down to chemical imbalance in your brain, mm -hmm. which that concept in itself is is 
hard to confirm medicine wise. Mm -hmm. uh, we've dealt with that for a long time. Um, but on the big in the big picture, anxiety mm -hmm. and depression is depression is living in the past and anxiety is living in the future. So if you can control your mindset to live in the present moment and not mm -hmm. think about what somebody's going to think about you if you do something or, or not thinking about what happened in the past, um, you can alleviate some of that. Well, that's a very difficult thing to do. Are you um, an advocate of meditation? or Absolutely. Yeah, so mm -hmm. sometimes when you're um, on these house calls, are you just like, okay, let's just breathe a little bit? Like yeah. teaching mm -hmm. you know, that aspect? Of yep. and, and trying to just shift your thinking. First of all, you have to be aware of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that, that, is, that is also another large problem. Um, but just shifting your thinking to what's going on right at this moment right now, mm -hmm. not what already happened or what might happen in the future. Um, I know there's a lot of studies, whether you call it science or um, medical science, about how we store things, how we store trauma, how like some of these thoughts do start to like create mm -hmm. like ailments and parts of our bodies. Like, okay, you're having this anxiety and now you, you know, you feel it in your heart or you feel it in your gut, we mm -hmm. talk about that a lot, right? Yeah. The gut's kind of the second brain. Um, what's your thoughts on some of those? Yeah, stuff? so they, and it comes back to anxiety again, um, and that sort of relates to all these thoughts. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it can cause so many physical symptoms that it's hard for people to believe it's anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I saw it a lot in the emergency room, people were having panic attacks, were having anxiety, having symptoms, you know, at a young age that they shouldn't have, and there's no medical explanation for it, and we you have a test to rule out all the bad things, um, and it comes down to anxiety. You you truly do feel it physically. You gotta deal with that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and and it it when it gets to a point in your mind, that's when it boils over and you feel physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. And and you're it, it basically all comes down to your mind. It's such a powerful thing. And and you know that's why. Uh, you know, there's so much stigma around mental health, mm -hmm. right? Um, like it's so much easier to go in and go, doctor, tell me what's wrong with me and let me take a pill so I don't have to deal with that stuff. Right. But like, um, and I uh, I don't know, like it, it's my big pet peeve with the world that like mental health should be, like we should be going to places like yoga centers for like tune-ups here and it should be just a thing. Like we work out, mm -hmm. everybody accepts that, but like this is amazing up it here is. and like it needs some um, some exercise and some yes. things to it release. Is, it is, your mind is so, so powerful. There was, a quote, uh, I'm a big fan of quotes. Okay. Um, it, this one, it was made famous by Will Smith. He said it in an interview. It's by Confucius. Mm -hmm. He said, he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you tell yourself things and you believe it and that's what happens. Yeah. And now that you can go to extremes and you can believe you're going to be a trillionaire and it's not just going to happen. <laughs> right. um, but it, it, it's just such a powerful thing and you can exercise it. It's more about not like what you can do or thinking differently. You mm -hmm. just have to recognize what you are thinking on a daily basis and tune it out mm -hmm. or shut off the bad stuff. Or like you said earlier, like really focusing on the now. So it's like that mm -hmm. question of like, well, what can I do right now? I mean, mm -hmm. um, what do I have control over in this exact moment? Right. Way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then and not the past and the future kind yeah. of you know. Put yeah. So I mean, like I, I I read the the news often. I see all videos online of, of bad things that are happening in the world and in the moment I say oh, that's, that's really terrible I feel bad for those people um, but then when I shut my phone off or I'm doing something else like I don't I don't dwell on it I don't think about it because it, it happened and I, I had my reaction to it and that's it yeah um, yes I, I, I think that that's the kind of a weird space we're in though right because there's um, there's so much I, we're so desensitized to how much stuff is there that it's like, well, I can't do anything about that. Um, and for your health reasons, yes, you should move on. But I also think like it's kind of a time where we also need a little bit of action. You know, yeah, like you too, yeah. find your thing. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this off camera earlier that you can't take you can't take on everything of the world. Right. Like you don't have the solutions mm -hmm. for everything. But there's like things that you can care about and make yeah. you know, and, and impact. Like exactly. You know, um, so you pick. You pick your thing. If there's, like, yeah, if there's something that you can do about it, then then go do it. Yeah. Um, but if you can't, then internalizing it is only going to lead to problems in the future. Mm -hmm. um, what are so you know, seeing doctors or you've seen patients at home? Um, general, just like 
uh, is there any myths that you want to put out? You want to demystify in terms of healthcare, or think, or, or your favorite tips that you always share? Like, you know, um, if this, if taking care of this is overwhelming, like, what are some of the things that are maybe start with just what's important to you? Like, how how you take care of yourself so you can show up and be totally present with these patients. Like, yeah. what's important to you? Um, I I'm a big fan of reading. Um, not like fictional or non-fictional mm -hmm. stories, just like biographies or mm -hmm. different ways of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. um, but just, I don't know, I guess, every, and everybody's different. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to be the same for everyone. But just finding you time and escaping and doing what you have to do for yourself. You know. So, you're, so you advocate for like a mental de decompression mm -hmm. time, like everybody needs their own time mm -hmm. to sort of... Okay. And it's not like blocking out what's happening. It's just dealing with it fully. Yeah. A lot of times we have reactions to things and we put it away and don't fully deal with it. What um, What are your thoughts on like our uh, food industry? Like some of the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's um, like, uh, I don't want to go here. <laughs> you know? it, so this is interesting. Yeah. Um, I wrote my, my master's thesis on dietary supplements mm -hmm. in medicine and there are a whole slew of issues with that. Mm -hmm. um, food is... It's something I think about often um, in terms that I, I think all of the things that we're putting into our food are mm -hmm. going to cause big problems in the future. Yeah. I think that cancer is probably going to be significantly increased. Um, it's food in like the topical things, we, like products, yeah, right? Like we so have, many chemicals. Yeah, but what, we have no idea, Some like from deodorant to lotions, cosmetics, mm -hmm. like what's in that we stuff won't. We won't for a and long time. and then the food like what is in processed foods right. yeah like, i think eating organic is the best thing that you can do um it's just so expensive it's hard for everyone to yeah. do yeah especially vegetables yeah uh i mean i think there's more especially in a place like los angeles there's definitely more um means to get uh vegetables and inexpensive inexpensive healthy options mm -hmm. but i know in, in many areas i mean i grew up in flint michigan and it's definitely like a food desert there like they have convenience stores and yeah. not you know i mean jeff bezos you have all this money put a whole foods in flint michigan for the love of god seriously like and yeah. make it affordable i mean who who can start <laughs> like it just drives me nuts but um we're we're lucky here we have options but um it's challenging. I mean, I, I live by myself, and like the worst thing about eating healthy is how fast stuff goes bad. And you like feel like yeah. you wasted it. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Midwest. Like you don't waste food. Right? Yeah. Like you clean the plate, yeah. <laughs> or you're in trouble. Um, you grew up in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Were you told that? Clean the plate. Yeah, I couldn't get up from the dinner table exactly. until I ate everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's challenging, but you know, there's so much information. Like there there's so much information out the world this is the one place that like we can actually use a place like YouTube to like how to eat more yeah. healthy how to eat on a $50 budget how to eat healthy mm -hmm. on a $50 budget mm -hmm. or whatever like you know whatever the budget is and just find something yeah, and healthy doesn't have to be organic yeah I mean just eating lean meats with a limited amount of carbs and a bunch of vegetables yeah is, go for color good. and not Cheetos color <laughs> yeah, <right>. yeah. <laughs> not the that. greens yeah greens. yeah yeah all right beets too like beets are so beautiful and yeah. yeah, a lot of people aren't turned off by these. Things. I know. Um, I yes, because they taste kind of earthy. Um, but there's a place not too far from where we are right now that makes this amazing beet salad, and really? I feel so good after I eat it, uh, and it doesn't have that like okay dirt mm. earth kind of you know taste. They're doing something cool. Um, all right, what what have we not covered? Like, what's important for you to to get across in terms of like you know why this system of maybe having house calls be more prevalent in our healthcare system, you know, is important to you. And Yeah, it, it's it's something that is, it, it gives a freedom back to the provider, right? And, and it it's a long ways from being like regular. And back up, when freedom to the provider, um, what freedom don't, don't yeah, help? So, yeah, like, yeah, I'll, I'll like, explain. Yeah, mm -hmm. explain sure. that. So, Many hospitals and healthcare centers and offices, everything, when it comes down to the big details, mm -hmm. is all dictated by reimbursement and money. And it all, all the money comes from the insurance companies. 
So they will tell you whether or not a patient can get a certain test or have a procedure done or they can take this medicine or that medicine. And they will tell you how much money your visit was worth based on the paperwork that you fill out for your documentation. Mm -hmm. So all of the so time, the I, emphasis is on that, yeah, not the so time with the patient. All of the, yeah. and that's why we don't spend. That's why you don't spend a lot of time in the office because you need to see more people so you get reimbursed more. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to what I said earlier about just sitting in front of the computer all day, just filling out our charts based on you know, our exams in the room with the patient. All of that is so we get reimbursed by insurance because they look at that and they they say they mark the what level of visit it was, whether it was really intense or if it was just a quick in and out, and they give you a certain amount of money for it. So with doing house calls and having my own company, APM Doc, um, I get to do a, a full thorough exam on everyone, spend mm -hmm. as much time as I want, <clears throat> asking the right questions, getting the right information, and doing tests that I feel are necessary and giving them the medicine that will work the best. I see. So it's mutually beneficial. It is. Patient, and mm -hmm. you get to provide the kind of health care. Yep, I get to practice medicine how I feel is the best. Mm -hmm. and it's the most beneficial for the patient and it's meaningful for me and it's a win win. That's awesome. Uh, so, you, do you hope you think this will be something in the future? Are we going to have like the like the, the Uber of uh, medical? Possibly. Yeah. Um, it, it, it will come down to numbers mm -hmm. um, and insurance companies well, and, or. And, some revisement at the top here. I mean, are like yeah. our government involved? Yeah, not until there there's a change with insurance companies and reimbursement. It, mm -hmm. it won't be mentioned. <laughs> and I don't know if that will ever happen. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Uh, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. Start. All right. Well, so there's a couple things that uh, we get to do, other things that we get to do together while you're here. So I always say there's like always more information in the room. We've heard a lot about what you do and what's important to you, but I want to get to like let people get to know you a little bit. And so the okay. way that we do that is just change the circumstances of how we're relating. And I just ask you a random, okay. might be silly. Sure. It's most likely silly question. Okay. You ready for that? Yeah. All right. And you could ask me one too. So the pressure is not totally on you. Okay. If you were like, see, I'm going to randomly take one out of here. Um, <laughs> what email do you most regret sending? Oh boy. You ever send all? Ever done that? <laughs> like, um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. You can't think of anyone? No. Have you no. drunk dialed anybody? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've done, Texting. I def definitely done that. Yeah, yeah, definitely done that. I don't see the thing with me is that I don't, I don't regret anything. Yeah. Um, I, I have one tattoo, and the tattoo says it was without regrets. Um, because I just think that. That uh, you can learn even the smallest amount of information from every opportunity. I agree with that. that happens. I've failed a lot in life. Let's do it. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. Okay. All right. Let's see what else. You want a better question box? What do you got for us? Okay. <laughs> what secrets will you keep from your children? This is pretty hypothetical. You're, you don't have children yet. Right? No, no, I don't. Okay. Um, at least until I'm. They're maybe older. Yeah. But most of my experience is in college. Okay. <laughs> you probably will never tell them that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could definitely. All right. I'm going to give you one more. If you want to ask me one, I'll give you one too. What alcohol can you never drink again? For a long time, it was a Bud Light. Bud Light? Mm hmm. Doesn't even sound like something you'd want yeah, to drink. Yeah, I just got sick off at once. Yeah. And, That's a total yeah. Midwestern beer, by the way. It All is. All right. You want to ask me one? Sure. This side we've used recently for the bigger side. What type of stealing is okay? Oh, geez. Um, I, now I'm thinking of every, I'm thinking of some um, rom-com, like a line from a romantic comedy, where it's like, it's okay to steal my heart. <laughs> like, I know okay. that's in some movie. I don't know which one it is. Yeah, that's the only thing that, like, okay. the only kind of stealing. Okay. I mean, like if you were doing sort of a, a Robin Hood type of stealing, you know, um, taking from someone that has too much or a company that has too much and giving it to somebody that's really in the, in the now. I don't think that's bad. I've never done it, but if I was put in the situation, I probably question. Yeah, I probably would do it in that case. Um, so yeah. steal the heart, steal for good people. Steal base and baseball. Oh yeah.
If one of your friends needed to move in for a year, who would you like it to be? Which friend? Yeah. Wow. I live in a loft. <laughs> That's like a year. You know, I really value, uh, I, I'm very extroverted. I love being with people. I love hosting events. and um, But I love my downtime. Mm -hmm. And a year, and, and my space is not that big. I don't really know who's on that list, to be honest with you. Like, uh, you know, a year I is even, a long time. A year is a long time in a lot with no right. like walls to divide you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there's even just a short list of, of friends and family that I would allow stay in my lap with me, mm -hmm. you know, just for periods of time. Cause, look, and it's for their benefit too, because yeah. I know like um, I had a situation when I first moved into my lap that a friend sort of overstayed. Um, came in for a visit and like overstayed and was just imp like just stepping over like every mm. sort of boundary or you know system that I had in play and I had just moved in and I had to ask this person to leave. Did you? Yeah, and and it, and I'm a Capricorn and apparently this is a trait of a Capricorn which I don't really sign off on astrology, but I um, you know I tend to like okay it's fine it's fine it's fine then it's not fine you know yeah. like it like builds up and it was one of those things and okay. so when I finally had to ask this person to leave it was a real blow up tense mm. moment which i was which added another layer i'm like now i'm upset with myself now i'm more upset with you that you took me to this level and it was just and that friendship did not recover from no. that incident it's a tough situation it's a tough situation there were other things though like this person was like um making comments about some of my religious beliefs and like there mm. was just so much treading on like wow you're in my home and you're like yeah really not cool yeah. <laughs> like at all. It was for the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would like to recover that friendship, but I, I maybe not. Um, I'm going to ask you one more. Okay. I'm going to switch gears. Um, what's the worst thing you, you do for a million dollars? The worst thing you would do? The worst million. thing? It's a tough question. It is. Like how, That's so hypothetical. What's the worst uh, thing? I don't know. You know what? I'm well, not, how about what what wouldn't you do? Let's like that's probably an easier. Like what wouldn't you do? I wouldn't commit a crime. Yeah. I, I'm not I mean, money is nice and it would help me tremendously. Yeah. But it it's a it's a short term play. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not really motivated by money too yeah. much. So what does motivate you? Um I guess hmm, that's that's a tough question. That's a deep one, huh? Yeah. Um, performing at my my highest potential, I think. Yeah. I think just doing the most that I, I possibly can. Yeah. Which really is anything. Yeah. So. I would say I'd have an answer that's close to that, like experiencing the fullness of life. I mean, for me, it's um, it's this actually. It's like really um, finding a way to connect with everybody. Yeah. Like I know there's so much tension and. Um, reasons, not reasons, but like just a trend towards making quick judgments about people and like dismissing them. And mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of like fun to like play in this space of like, well, what, what, how are we connected? How do yeah. we end up here together? Right. Like, how are we having this conversation? Like, that's like, and and to experience more things in the now in this fullness, like that motivates me too. Mm -hmm. I I had a, a early career. I I can't tell you how many times. Um, employers, bosses, mostly men, male bosses were like, we can't figure you out. Like, we don't mm. know what motivates you. And even though I've been in sales positions and things and I was good at selling, like, I wasn't motivated by money either. You know, it was this other thing. And, and it really, really messes people up when they're trying to understand what you're about. Mm. If that's not the motivation or like if you, if, if, if they can't figure out why you're, what's yeah. the motivation. What I think about is, is like, I think about the future of my life, and mm -hmm. if I look back, you know, well, I wish I had done something different, or wish I had tried something else, or mm -hmm. wish I had tried harder, or put myself more into something. Um, I think about that a lot, mm -hmm. and I think that a lot of people do. Just it's too late, and I'm actually working on setting something. I was very early, mm -hmm. um, but interviewing elderly people mm -hmm. on video and asking them. What they think about their life mm -hmm. and what what 
Do they think about times where they thought something was so catastrophic or was so bad if they can even remember that? Yeah. You know, if it truly mattered or if it truly was that big of a deal. I love that. I love old people. They have I the best. Too, yeah. They tell the best mm -hmm. stories. They do. They tell the best stories, and and I that's a great project. We should yeah. talk more about that because, um, you know, I don't think our country does a good job of taking care of our our aging parents or grandparents right. like other cultures. Like they bring them in, they yeah. you know they um, they build the granny suite right away, or they're already there. Right. They already live in the, in the same area, but we don't do a really good yeah. job at that. And my my, my thought is that they, they just have so much knowledge about their life experience yeah. like they've lived for so long and they've experienced so many things and learned so many lessons yeah. that other people need to hear that so yeah. that they learn it before it's too late and they're usually not editing that like we're still sort of like oh i don't know if i should say yeah. this you know if you're in your career because yeah. uh, what do they care yeah exactly exactly and that that their mindset like that is how yeah. i think everybody should be every day yeah not caring what other people think about you just doing whatever you feel is you and you feel is right yeah I like it. I like it. Yeah. Oh, see, we learned new stuff about yeah. you. I really like that. All right. Well, so we have um, we get to do like two more things together. And okay. um, so the first one is I always ask each guest that's here that sits in that chair to do what um, we call a heart swell, which is basically just acknowledging somebody could could be someone, a group of people that's like really made a difference that in your life, like you really appreciated them for teaching you something. Um, for acting out, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a gesture of forgiveness, wh whatever it is, they've motivated you in some way, and um, this is your this is your chance to say, to give them a shout out. And the reason that I ask people to do this is like, I think we need to do this more for each other and not be afraid to like express deep feelings. And and hopefully, in doing this, people go, oh, that's easy. I'll do that. I'll call my grandma today or mm -hmm. you know, give a shout out. So, first of all, are you willing to do one? Yeah. Do you have one in mind? I think so. Okay, yeah. so you can look at the camera okay. and like talk to that person. All right, so this is not one single person, but um, all of the uh, doctors and PAs that I worked with previously at SCEP, um, I just I learned so much from all of you, and I learned how to practice really, really good medicine, and it it truly is ingrained in who I am as a person now, and I appreciate that. Awesome medical shout. That's our first medical professional shout out. All right, so the last thing that we get to do is um, we usually an, a, issue a social challenge of the week, and it's just something that people can try. You know, it might be a journaling project. It might be, you know, a communication exercise, but just something that um, by, by simply trying it, might, they might discover some things about them or it might enrich their life in some way. Um, so, and I usually try to pull something from our conversation to sure. come up with that. Um, I think so. What's coming up for me, and we didn't talk too much about this, but I know we talked off off camera sure. about this, is um, how someone can be a better advocate for their own yeah. health. Um, so maybe so. What's come? What's what's coming up for me? And, and please add to this, or go now. Nah, I'm kind of feeling this. Um, is maybe taking a, a preventative step, if, like if you do have a doctor's visit coming up, or um, or maybe you just went on one and you were given like this prescription and you're like, I don't know, like I, I'm, I don't know if I want to take this or, you know, mm -hmm. um, being able to kind of sit down and write out like all the questions that you didn't ask in that situation or that you would like to ask, but, you know, kind of taking control or maybe um, be more preventative with mm -hmm. your health care. So that's kind of what I'm feeling. What do you, what's your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, it's a whole bunch of things running through my head. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it is very important for you to ask questions at your doctor's visits, whether it's your doctor or if you're in the ER or if it's somebody you've never met before. Um, ask the questions. Nobody's going to judge you if it's a dumb question. There are no dumb questions. I promise. I, I, I've been asked so many things that are seemingly ridiculous that I can't even remember what they are. They were not stupid. Um, ask as many questions as you can. I personally, as a provider, every single patient I've ever seen the last thing they said in the room was asked if they had any questions. Mm -hmm. And an even better way to say it is sort of what questions do you have? Because you always have questions. And people are scared to ask. And then they get home and they think about that question more and more and they get anxious about not knowing the answer. And this leads to a whole bunch of things. So even if your doctor said, does not ask you if you have questions, stop them before they leave and ask the question. Yeah. I, we're a huge advocate of question asking on this yeah. show. I mean, you I have to be curious. Humans yeah. are curious. We 
and not a lot of people tap into that yeah because they're they're scared about judgment yeah and you just have to ask questions how do you learn and it and it's actually a, we talked about setting boundaries or um, practicing boundaries uh, a couple shows ago and like asking questions is like the the glue in every relationship it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what the dynamic is so the better you get at it but you know the better off you're going to be and um you know if you're not seeing a doctor like you know or a medical professional like alex in a house call situation um in a doctor's office like even if you don't feel comfortable asking maybe um the doctor asked the nurse or like you know yeah. find your own boundaries or even through call this. if you're back at home call, call the office and and it might take one or two or three calls or messages because it's just sometimes how it works but yeah ask somebody don't i would say not to ask google yeah i, was just uh, thinking I wrote that. a paper on that once <laughs> yeah, yeah. about um paging dr google is what yeah, it's yeah. called and it just did that that can that often has created reasons for people to go to the emergency room when they didn't need to yeah so yeah so questions good for people that are actually involved right. in your healthcare mm -hmm. situation and but not for google like that's right. you know like actually ask a person that's treated you met you knows some of your systems has wrote down things on, you know mm -hmm. diagnosis charts like yeah. those are the people that we should be asking questions mm -hmm. and if they you know you've heard alex say you know all all um, physicians, um, people that are practicing medicine, they're rushed. They're like, they've got to put their time in and filling out charts and forms. So um, it's not an excuse. It's not. No, it's not. I'm not but saying it it's. Just, a, but it that. Happens, but that's yeah. the situation they're yeah. in. So they might be. They. They. Um, they are not even really. They might not be aware. You know that they're in that con that loop. Mm -hmm. um, but you, as a patient, that's per, that is paying for healthcare. You know, um, you have to stop yeah. them and go. And like, if you feel like it's not a good situation, if your if your provider is not giving you what you need, or then there's nothing wrong with finding a new one. Well, and that's the point. I think that asking these questions, like you don't know, like who is responsible and who you're giving control of your healthcare, essentially, until you ask more questions and you get more information, mm -hmm. and then you might make that decision. Like, you know what? Yeah. We're not aligned here. Like I'm not. Feel, I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I don't accept that diagnosis. I want a little bit more information yeah. or a second. And to me, like that. That's something that I'm extremely passionate about, especially when it comes to medicine as a whole. Is mm -hmm. Patient education is the most valuable thing about practicing, in my in my opinion, and it's it's something I really stress. And mm -hmm. every patient I've, I've just about ever seen, um, I explain every single thing that I like my thought process about the symptoms they have and what could be going on, the possibilities, what we're going to do about it to check it, and then I educate them about what their diagnosis mm -hmm. is in terms that they can understand. That alleviates anxiety, makes them feel like I've given them value, they're satisfied with their visit, and mm -hmm. they, they leave happy. Perfect. So patient education is, is huge, and if you're not getting it, then ask for it or, or find somebody that values that. Amen. We're going to leave it at that. I love that. Uh, well, Alex, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. I think it was a great conversation. I hope people, uh, if, if anything, what we just talked about is the inspiration. It's like really take, um, remember that you are responsible for your health care mm -hmm. and like ask these questions and you'll be in a better situation yeah. with your uh, providers. So thank you for that. Um, you can find out more about Alex and his company at ampmdoc.com and he's on Instagram at ampm doc underscore la. Um, all that will share in the archives so people can find you and you know find out what you're doing. Um, so appreciate you being here. Thank you Thank so much you. for having me. Uh, next week, I'm also really really excited about the show that we're doing next week. Um, I'm going to have two gentlemen from the Mankind Project that will be here talking about the work that they're doing with men. Um, you know, around some of the issues that you know men may be experiencing in the world in terms of like how roles and things are changing. Um, I'm really excited about their work, and so that will be next week. Uh, and as always, you're going to love this because we talked about it. Um, this is how I sign up the show. Relate with more curiosity. That's our thing. So wow. everybody just relate with more curiosity, and uh, see you next week.